And on the line with us right now is Dave Levitan. Dave is a climate reporter with Grid.News, a science journalist, the author of the book Not a Scientist, How Politicians Mistake, Misrepresent, and Utterly Mangle Science. Uh, you can find that over his website, Dave Levitan, uh, L-E-V-I-T-A-N.com. And uh, Dave Levitan is also his, his Twitter handle, no surprise. Dave, welcome to the program. And thanks, thanks so much, very for, much for having me. My pleasure. So, uh, first of all, the the takeaways from the UN IPCC, the the you know the, the big climate change group for the United Nations that's looking into how we, you know, the state of the world, as it were, is uh, preparing. I believe their sixth uh, big presentation, and we're getting some reports out about what's you know. Uh, particularly about methane was the one that I saw. What you you want to bring us up to date on the IPCC? Sure. So uh, yeah, they they released their latest report uh, this this Monday actually uh, as part of as you said their big sixth assessment report, which takes the better part of a year to release all of it. But uh, the latest was about what they call mitigation pathways, the the ways that we actually could uh, mitigate climate change or fix it, and it is as you might expect pretty dire. Uh, they basically said we have to peak global emissions by 2025, which really is very soon, considering that emissions continue to rise. So that was sort of the big take home message, I think. But there's plenty more in there. And yes, as you said, today there was some news about methane concentrations uh, having gone up a record amount last year, uh, beating the previous year's record. So not great in that realm either. Right. And an awful lot of that is uh, you know, the off gassing from wells that have been abandoned to these companies. They they uh, pump the oil out. They take the money to the bank, and then they, uh, you know, and then they bankrupt the company. So there's no liability can go back on them. And then you've got these old wells that are leaking methane, um, hundreds of millions of, of pounds a year, I believe. Yeah, that's right. There's a, there's a lot of uh, sort of um, rogue emissions, basically, from from pipelines, from you know previously used wells, from all sorts of facilities like that. There's also other sources of methane, like agriculture in particular, is a big one. Um, as well as just land use change as well can can release a lot of methane. But yeah, the uh, oil and gas industry certainly um, represents a big source and it also represents a pretty big opportunity because it's not particularly difficult to close some of those leaks if, if right. you actually have the motivation to do so. Yeah, amen. We're talking with Dave Levitan, the climate reporter with Grid.News. Uh, Dave, tell us about solar geoengineering. Sure. So solar geoengineering is an idea that would basically sort of artificially cool the planet briefly uh, or, you know, ongoing as we try to reduce emissions. I want to stress this is not happening yet. Some people, there are conspiracy theorists out there who think that it is. It is not. But it is an idea that is under discussion uh, because we are, you know, sort of failing in the, the efforts to actually reduce emissions. Um, and the, the concept is basically that you would uh, bring a bunch of planes high up into the stratosphere and dump small particles. Sulfate aerosols is the most commonly cited one. So very small bits of sulfur, basically, that reflect sunlight back into space. So it reduces the total amount of sunlight that hits the Earth, and this could probably cool the planet. So that's the, the basic premise there. Isn't there, I, I mean, there, there have to be dangers and consequences associated with that. And not just, you know, sulfur raining down out of the sky, you know, presumably forming sulfur dioxide at those at those atmospheric levels uh, after we finally got control of sulfur dioxide. But also, I mean, if you're cooling one region and not another, aren't you running the risk of like messing with ocean currents or the jet stream? So, yeah, there are definitely some risks in that regard. Um, the part of the problem with this is that research has been pretty slow to, to sort of get going. So there's still a lot of open questions, but we do know that there would be basically sort of winners and losers with this. There would be, you know, some regions might improve, like, you know, the, uh, uh, say, crop yields would be better in certain regions, but they might be worse in others. So there are definitely winners and losers. There's some hints that it could alter, you know, monsoon patterns in Southeast Asia, which, of course, is a big deal for uh, the livelihoods of the people who live there. Um, it could change um, some of the, the crop patterns and precipitation patterns in sub-Saharan Africa as well. But really, the, the, the main take home here is that we need to do a lot more research on this. There's just not an answer to all of these various questions. There's, it, it's yeah. growing, but there's still a lot of holes in the research. Yeah, it seems to me that, that probably focusing on stopping emissions as quickly as possible, number one. And number two, uh, carbon capture technology, which up to this point has been mostly a PR scam for the fossil fuel industry. 
um, you know, most of the projects. Although Iceland's got one that's powered by geothermal that, that looks like it might be interesting. But it seems to me like those would be the two areas to focus on first. Yeah, absolutely. I think e even the people doing the work on solar geoengineering, geo excuse me, geoengineering say that the, the more central project is absolutely reducing emissions as quickly as possible. I think that's sort of universally agreed upon. And yeah, carbon capture would be wonderful if it worked. It has not, you know, as you said, it hasn't quite made it to prime time yet. Um, the, the project in Iceland is interesting. Yeah, it's, it's pulling CO2 directly out of the sky, basically, which we do need to do a lot more of. And, and since you mentioned the IPCC, they actually, that most recent report specifically said that that kind of work, carbon dioxide removal or CDR, is going to be necessary in order to actually really achieve what we're trying to achieve. So that definitely needs to be scaled up in a big way and made a lot cheaper because right now it's it's very expensive. Right. Yeah, I, I, I visited, uh, we were making a, a movie, uh, Ice on Fire, and we visited uh, a, a big uh, facility in Germany where they were doing a demonstration project on it and they were like nowhere near close to, to the, the the, that tipping point of, t of efficiency where you're actually drawing more carbon out of the atmosphere than you're generating for the atmosphere to produce the power to drive the system that's drawing it back out again. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's just very, very problematic. Dave Levitan is the climate reporter with Grid.News, a science journalist and author of the book, Not a Scientist, How Politicians Mistake, re Misrepresent, and Utterly Mangle Science. Um, and you can read his writes, writing also over at Grid.News. You can reach him on Twitter at Dave Levitan and uh, DaveLevitan.com. Dave, thanks so much for dropping by today. Thanks very much for having me. My pleasure, my pleasure. Good talking with you. We'll be back, it's 42 minutes past the hour. Stick around. You're listening to Tom Hartman. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. Uh, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson just got uh, the final sign off by the United States Senate. She'll be on the court this summer. Back with your calls in a moment. And welcome back, Josh in Miami, Florida. Hey, Josh, what's on your mind today? Listening to us on TuneIn, Josh? Hey, Tom, how's it going? Good. What's on your mind? Good. Um, I was just thinking about the Supreme Court, and I was wondering, is it better to think about it as unpacking the court? And, yeah. And think about this as, you know, because they have the high ground in the argument, it seems like, and there's no way that they should. I agree. Um, you know, Tom, I agree. Thomas should be impeached, investigate Kennedy in that whole situation. I mean, Kavanaugh. Yep. And, and yeah, and the, the, we never saw, you know, we only saw fewer than 1% of all of Kavanaugh's papers from the time that he was in the Bush, just, uh, Bush Justice Department and, and presumably advising Bush on torture uh, policies and issues. Um, you know, we don't know who paid off his credit cards. I mean, there's a lot of questions about Kavanaugh. And uh, you know, 1,500 uh, reports to the FBI on that guy. Yeah, and you've got and you've got uh, you know uh, Amy Coney Barrett, who had never been a judge. I mean, you know, be, be, before I, she she was just put on the court, she'd never she as a as a lawyer, she had never tried a case. I mean, it was just it's breathtaking um, how Disgusting. unqualified she is. So yeah, I'm with you. I think that we should unpack the court rather than pack there. And of course, you know, holding up Merrick Garland, who should be on the court. Um, I'm I'm Absolutely. with you on all those things, Josh. Um, what about some oversight? Can the can Congress do anything about oversight for the Supreme Court? It's debatable. There are people who say no. I published a piece a couple of weeks ago saying yes, they can. That Article Three, Section Two of the Constitution that says that that, con that the Supreme Court shall be regulated by Congress um, mm -hmm. includes the ability of Congress to impose a code of ethics on the court. I I published mm -hmm. that, and on Twitter, I I just got jumped all over by a a, a lawyer that I respect who is saying, no, no, you can't do that, no way. Um, I wow. disagree, and one of these days I'm gonna write another piece kind of pushing back on the pushing back. So, because yeah. you know, John Roberts, when he was in the Reagan White House, spent a year putting together a paper, a 27-page paper for the Reagan White House about how Congress could overturn Roe v. Wade and Brown versus Board of Education, which were the two big cases that the Reagan, you know, Reagan wanted to overturn, um, that they could do that based on that Article Three, Section Two of the of the U.S. Constitution assertion of the right of or power of Congress to regulate the United States Supreme Court. So, if they could do that in John Roberts' mind, 
then at the very least they could impose a conduct, a code of judicial conduct. But um, just the the the, the uh, Clarence Thomas stuff, I, I'm I'm watching this just vanish from the from the TV screens now. And you know, yeah. Thomas's Thomas and his wife are sitting around going, "Well, we just had to hold our breath for a week or two and just let the news cycle move along." And thank God for the war in Ukraine. And um, you know, and 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 I don't think we should be letting go of this. I think that we need to be focusing on on you know how corrupt is the Supreme Court now? Uh, Amy Coney Barrett, whose father was a Shell lawyer, if I'm recalling correctly, or a lawyer for the fossil fuel industry for decades. Uh, ruling mm -hmm. on fossil fuel uh, things. Uh, Neil Gorsuch, mm -hmm. his mother, Gorsuch's you know, had mother. to resign from the EPA in disgrace after three years running it under the Reagan administration because she was basically trying to destroy it. And and he's weighing in on the EPA now. I mean, it's just it's it's nuts.